I would like to invite on stage our moderator for this session, very distinguished moderator, and it is uh, my pleasure to now invite the Honourable Tan Sri Datuk Sri Dr. Zeti Akhtar Aziz, the Governor of Central Bank of Malaysia. And I would also like to invite all the speakers for this session, Dr. Jamil El Jarudi, the CEO of Bank Nizwa, the Sultanate of Oman, Professor Abu Nasir Muhammad Abdul Zahe, he's the chairman of the Islamic Consultative Forum, Islamic Banks Consultative Forum Bangladesh, and chairman of the Islamic Banks Bangladesh Limited. Mr. Talal Yassin, OAM, founder and managing director, Crescent Wealth Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to be excused uh, because I was given, um, first of all, um, would like to welcome the keynote speaker, and then we'll continue with the forum. Uh, my sincere apologies to, to Tansri. And please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Tansri Datuk Dr. Zeti Akta Aziz, the Governor of Central Bank of Malaysia, to address us, the Priscilla. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. It's a very good morning to you all. It's a pleasure and honor for us to be here. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, WIEF for allowing us to showcase Islamic finance and showcase by one of the leaders of Islamic finance, the governor, Tansri Zeti Akhtar Aziz. Let me tell you something about the governor that many of you do not know that's not in her bio. I've had the honor and pleasure of uh, working with her. And she is a governor's governor. She is a leading lady of Islamic finance and a number of magazines have positioned her that way. But more importantly, and this is what I impress upon all you all, her speeches are required reading at least for my team of 22 people at Thomson Reuters, because her speeches give you a pulse of Islamic finance about the road ahead, about the challenges. She's actually a stakeholder onto herself in Islamic finance. World leaders like the present managing director of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, have come to Malaysia and have talked to the governor, have got insights from the governor on Islamic finance. With that, it is an honor and a pleasure, Governor, to introduce you for your keynote speech. The Honorable Tansri Dr. Zeti Akhtar Aziz. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, powerful forces of change are now transforming the functioning of the international financial system and the global economy. In the aftermath of the global financial crisis, the quest has been to build financial systems that will best serve the real economy, that provides financial intermediation that promotes sustainable growth through productive and responsible innovation, and that will be resilient to shocks and less prone to crises. There's tremendous potential to draw on the economic value that Islamic finance has to offer. In realizing this potential in a now more challenging environment will depend on our capacity to build new capabilities that will unleash the intrinsic and inherent value propositions of Islamic finance that supports 
and energizes the real economy. It is my honor today to participate in this 8th World Islamic Economic Forum in my hometown, Johovaru, to speak on the topic Banking on Islamic Finance from Legality to Economic Value. The first part of my remarks will elaborate on the economic value of Islamic finance in terms of its emphasis on the clo close link to the real economy, in terms of its merit as a potent tool to enhance financial inclusion, and in terms of its emergence as a vehicle in bridging economies and strengthening economic and financial linkages, in particular um, between emerging economies. The second part of my remarks will touch on three key imperatives that will be important to the ability of e Islamic finance to enhance its value proposition to the global economy. These include the legal framework, in particular that which supports its internationalization, the pool of talent that has the international exposure and orientation, and finally, the convergence and harmonization of the Sharia interpretations across jurisdictions. These imperatives will be key to reinforcing the gains from the increased economic interlinkages. There are three core propositions of Islamic finance that can be harnessed as the industry continues with its rapid growth momentum. The first is to ensure that Islamic finance remains a form of financial intermediation that serves the real economy. In this current environment, following the global financial crises, this is a, uh, an issue that has been raised again and again. Finance must return to, uh, well, banking in particular must return to basic banking. It also must be continue to be a benefit to society. In staying true to the inherent principles of Islamic finance, financial transactions will be underpinned by real economic activities. This ensures its close link to the economy as it directs overall intermediation function towards economic production, and wealth creation. This therefore requires the continuous development of financial products and services that manifest the value propositions of Islamic finance. In providing the comprehensive range of the whole spectrum of financial products and services that are in accordance with these principles, Islamic finance has been able to provide the total financial solution to consumers and businesses. The recent growth of Islamic finance has been fueled by a sustained phase of innovation. The scope of financial business has also increased in sophistication, particularly in the areas of private equity, project finance, sukuk origination, as well as fund and wealth management. To sustain, to sustain this trend, further in-depth applied research is needed to develop more financial products that create such links with the real economy in terms of the operating models, risk management, and supporting infrastructure. The second value proposition of Islamic finance lies in its merit as a potent tool for enhancing financial inclusion and for being beneficial to all members of society. This is something that we must not lose sight to because it contributes to balanced growth and socio 
economic stability. The immense potential in advancing socio-economic development is mirrored by the continuing efforts to introduce Islamic finance offerings in emerging economies, particularly in Asia, the Middle East, and African nation in the recent years. And this is when we talk about financial inclusion, we're not just talking within national financial systems to bring all communities into the economic mainstream, but we want to draw in uh, developing countries so that they participate in the global uh, growth and development. In bringing unserved communities in the economic, into the economic mainstream through the financial intermediation process, it can contribute towards poverty alleviation, job creation, and more equitable economic growth. A recent study has, however, revealed, and I believe it's by the World Bank, that despite being a promising financial segment, the availability of products such as in microfinance, in Muslim-majority economies, is either non-existent or still at a very early stage. Islamic financing instruments currently comprise only a small fraction of microfinance business in the organization of Islamic uh, corporation countries. While there are success stories on the application of Islamic principles in microfinance programs, there is potential to have better models for Islamic fi uh, microfinance. In addition, it should also integrate with other financial products such as takaful and other social welfare tools such as wakaf to create a viable and impactful microfinance initiative. There are also immense opportunities for Islamic finance to leverage on the productive potential for small and medium scale enterprises through greater application of equity-based structures in such financing structures. There is seemingly a natural fit between Islamic finance and SME financing in that both strongly promote entrepreneurship and value creation activities. The third value proposition of Islamic finance refers to its emergence as a new vehicle in bridging economies and contributing to increasing the financial linkages, in particular amongst the emerging economies. Previously, Islamic finance was very domestic-centric. It is now increasingly providing financial solutions for cross-border trade and investment. Progressive liberalization has facilitated the internationalization of Islamic finance. This has been reinforced by the dynamic pace of innovation in Islamic finance that has widened the range of financial products and services to meet this objective. And this internationalization process has thus contributed to more efficient allocation of funds across borders from centers with surplus funds to regions with investment opportunities, and it also promotes the diversification of risks. Ladies and gentlemen, the now more developed Islamic financial markets have been particularly instrumental in intermediating such funds. Of course, we all know that the Sukuk market has been a major driving force behind this development since its emergence as an important platform for international fundraising and investment activities that are generating increased cross-border flows. The international dimension of the Sukuk market has now evolved on many fronts. It has seen the participation of issuers and investors across continents with Sukuk origination centers 
transcending the issuer's own home countries. The total global sukuks outstanding now domiciles in 20 countries, and more recently, there has been a growing trend for multi-currency sukuk issuance. The sukuk market continues to solidify its position as a leading segment of growth for Islamic finance. Its strong performance is driven by its unique value proposition, both for issuers and investors. For investors, it has now become a new asset class with orientation towards real underlying assets in which the issuer cannot leverage in excess of the asset value and in which financing must be channeled to productive purposes. For issuers, Sukuk financing provides a competitive avenue for fundraising and access to a wider investor base for both Islamic and conventional, including the growing investor base looking now for a socially responsible or ethical investment. This has grown immensely, particularly following the global financial crisis. There's immense interest on socially responsible and ethical uh, investments. Moving forward, there are three key imperatives that will determine the ability of Islamic finance to further enhance its value propositions for the global economy. First is the evolution of the legal framework that is facilitative to the continuing market evolution and the internationalization of Islamic finance. Whilst the global financial crisis has provided Islamic finance with a unique opportunity in the international financial system, the future success of the industry moving forward will also de depend on its continuing ability to innovate more indigenous Sharia-based instruments and evolve business models that strengthens the nexus of Islamic finance with the real economy. An essential part of the overall infrastructure, therefore, is an effective legal framework to provide an enabling environment that will enforce the legality of contracts according to the Sharia and the regulatory treatment of the new and innovative Islamic finance solutions. While Islamic finance practitioners and scholars continue to draw from the source of fiqh muamalat to create new and innovative instruments, the legal framework needs to be further strengthened to ensure alignment with new market developments. This is to ensure that it continues to lend certainty and predictability to the innovative products and financial transactions. Furthermore, as Islamic finance activities venture beyond national boundaries, the development of legal frameworks that is facilitative of cross-border transactions is pivotal. There has to be court recognition and acceptance of Islamic contracts within the common and civil law systems with a common approach to interpreting the rights of contracting parties based on Sharia principles, in particular for the cross-border transactions. Malaysia has taken the approach to address this imperative via the Law Harmonization Committee, which was just established in 2010. As part of its mandate, the committee undertakes an objective review of the legislation and proposes the necessary amendments on existing Malaysian law, which are ap applicable to execute the whole chain of Islamic financial practices. Since its inception, the Law Harmonization Committee has reviewed now 17 
laws in Malaysia and has identified the areas that require legislate, legislative amendments so that Islamic financial transactions can be conducted in the most legally efficient manner. The work of the committee will continue to remain relevant as Islamic financial markets continue to expand and develop new products and new business models. The mandate of the committee will not only ensure that non-Sharia compliant elements in the legal provisions are harmonized, it will also ensure that our laws are facilitative to Islamic financial transactions. Another milestone, major milestone in Malaysia that I would like to mention is the new legal framework for bank, Islamic banking and takaful, which is currently undergoing the legislative process towards its enactment. This new legal framework will not only streamline the legal requirements across sectors, but it will also ensure that the law is reflective of the nature and feature of Sharia contracts and that the degree of regulation is commensurate with the level of risks that Islamic financial institutions, markets, and products pose to the overall financial system. An important attention for us is to give priority to issues that relate to financial stability. We do not want to see that Islamic finance progresses without commensurate regulatory and supervisory arrangements. The greater clarity on the legal and prudential requirements underpinned by Sharia principles will enable participants of the Islamic financial system to align their practices and expectations accordingly when undertaking Islamic financial business and transactions. Ladies and gentlemen, the second imperative relates to the continuous effort to develop the key resources of the industry by expanding and building new capabilities needed to support its growth and development. There is a critical need to upskill the leadership and technical competencies of talent given the increased complexity of the industry. With broader scope, scale, and internationalization, the demands on the capability of talents in Islamic finance can only increase. It will require more internationally oriented management teams that have the necessary international exposure and orientation. In addition to education and research to build the expertise in Islamic finance, a more structured framework for capacity building that also includes other key resources, including investment in information technology and technology for the industry development, is also needed. Such a coordinated effort in capacity building has been initiated by the Islamic Development Bank, that I'm pleased to say, in support of its member countries in the development of Islamic finance. This is being undertaken through the IDB's Member Countries Partnership Strategy Program. Indeed, in a world of increasing interconnectedness, there is a need for such strategic approach to capacity building through cross-border cooperation for the mutual benefit of the members so that growth and development of the industry can be collectively strengthened. Finally, the third imperative is to accord importance to mutual recognition of Sharia interpretations across jurisdictions and thus contribute towards greater international financial integration. A critical factor that will support this process pertains to the need to enhance awareness in respect of the justifications underlying the Sharia resolutions in the industry. To achieve this greater awareness will require both openness on the grounds for the rulings and in-depth research on the basis of these grounds. A recent conducted study by the International Sharia Research Acad Academy 
for Islamic finance, that is ISRA, on fatwas of Sharia boards in, a in the Asian region and the GCC countries reveal that contrary to popular perception, there are more similarities than differences in Sharia resolutions between the two regions. The study by ISRA, however, further indicates, however, that there's a lack of awareness on the Sharia justifications to most of the resolutions being reviewed. This awareness is essential to pave the way for, towards greater understanding and nurturing of mutual respect. While there are some initiatives to enhance the greater awareness on the juristic reasoning in Sharia in, in Islamic finance, to facilitate greater mutual recognition, it will require greater transparency in the Sharia rulings, in addition to constructive dialogue on the grounds of such rulings. While the efforts of the Islamic Development Bank and the Islamic Financial Services Board, the IFSB, and the Accounting and Auditing Organization for Islamic Financial Institutions, IOFI, it has facilitated greater cross-border engagement amongst practitioners and Sharia scholars. In turn, this has contributed to a greater understanding on issues and challenges faced by the industry and the progressive convergence on the Sharia views and rulings that we have seen in the recent years. More such international collaborative work and engagement would further facilitate this harmonization process. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude. To navigate amidst turbulent seas, to arrive at the new frontier of opportunities in Islamic finance, there is a need for the industry to build on its strength and achievements thus far in pursuit to realize the distinctive value that Islamic finance brings to the global economy. Indeed, Islamic finance needs to leverage on its inherent strengths and demonstrate leadership in the real economic agenda and contribute towards global economic prosperity and stability. Thank you. Thank you to the Honorable Tanshridat Sri Dr. Zeti Akta Aziz. And we shall now proceed with the session. I'd like to invite on stage uh, Dr. Jamil El Jaroudi, Professor Abu Nasir Muhammad Abu Zahe, and Mr. Talal Yassin OAM. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you very much. As I said in my brief remarks, that uh, her speeches are required reading for us in Islamic finance. What I wanted to do is basically share with you the administrative part of how we're going to undertake this session. Basically, after the keynote speech, I've got some opening remarks, sums up some of the points that the governor has said, and some of the high-level points that we anticipate discussing. Then each of the panelists will make a five to seven minute remark. We'll move on to the next one. And after all the panelists have spoken, we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, for the Q&A, let's stick to what the discussion is about. So no mini speeches from you and just one question and keep it short. Okay? Thank you. With respect to um, this, uh, some remarks here, moving from a niche market to mainstream application, mainstream application in three areas, asset classes, regulations, and liquidity. Islamic finance, it took 40 years to hit the 1 trillion mark, so it, where we were at 1.0. To get to 2.0 or $2 trillion, it's anticipated that it will take until 2015, 2016. The governor had mentioned innovation as one of the key drivers of Islamic finance. Innovation, cross-sell, more transactions, more asset classes. That's how we will arrive at 2.0. The four points that I'd like to impress in, the, in one minute. One is, 
what is the secret of Malaysia in Islamic finance? The second is, Islamic finance is no longer an oil phenomenon, it's a documentation phenomenon. Third is, what is the lesson learned from conventional finance? A futurist once said that to move an industry forward, it's not money in the hands of the few, but information in the hands of the many. And the last point is what the governor had talked about in terms of the cross-border of Islamic finance. We've come up with a phrase called STARS. And I'll start off with that. STAR stands for Sharia, Tax, Accounting, Regulation, and Standardization. For a jurisdiction to have a robust Islamic finance on its soil and then export beyond its shores, STARS has to exist. With respect to lesson from conventional finance, the biggest challenge in Islamic finance is information intermediation. Information intermediation needs to rise to the level of conventional efficiency because it's at that point in time we will get the cross-sell of Islamic finance. When information about it is available on the dashboard of traders and investors, whether it's in Belgium, Belarus, or Brazil. Islamic finance is no longer an oil phenomenon. It's a documentation phenomenon. What I mean by that is if we look at how and what some of the Gulf banks are raising money from. They're not raising money only in their backyard. They're coming to Malaysia. Malaysia's system, which goes to my next point, it's based on the five C's as I look at it. First one is commitment. Islamic finance in Malaysia was born at one level in 1983. The second is continuity. Succeeding prime ministers, central bank governors, such, our, such as our governor, has basically continued and expanded the robustness of Islamic finance. Third is the coordination amongst the stakeholders of Islamic finance, whether it's the Securities Commission, the Central Bank, the industry bodies, or the private sector. And finally, Sharia scholars. Once you have coordination, you've built a community, and the community is robust, and the community is now contributing to the growth and development of Islamic finance. Having said those five C's, the most important of all, and the governor has basically said that, there's no complacency for Islamic finance in Malaysia. That's why Malaysia is the tip of the spear in leading Islamic finance forward. So those are the points that I wanted to leave with you as part of my opening remarks. Let me turn the mic over to my dear colleague whose bio is in your packets, Dr. Jamil Jaroudi. He is uh, the CEO of Bank Nizwa. Dr. Jamil. Honorable Tensi, Dr. Zeppi, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad Khatam al-Anbiya wa al in order for us to generally answer a broad question like, can Islamic finance break into mainstream through invest investing in its economic value? I think we need to actually assess the present Islamic finance landscape. But I'm not going to repeat what we see in every conference, where the same cliche is over repeated, that it's in that number of countries, and its size is that so many dollars, and so and so, it's growing at that rate. Rather, I would like to present an idea today, which I believe it helps in, in deducting an answer, rather than answering the question. We know for a fact that Islamic finance has been developed in many countries and many economies with varying degrees of success. But also I believe that mapping should not imply only geography, size, and rate of growth, but also we should keep in mind the products available and the tools, and if these products and instruments do meet the demand of customers. Malaysia is arguably done a great deal on this matter because of strong political will and cohesive approach by the authorities. They approached it from all angles, including training the practitioners to support the need of the industry and training Sharia scholars in this field to support the growth. Thus, from the supply side, I think Malaysia have achieved fantastically well 
relatively. And we all are sure that there is more still to be done. However, one area perhaps under-recognized, not only in Malaysia, but arguably in all Islamic nations, is the need for the demand side to be developed. And I'm referring to the basic consumers. Are they demanding Islamic finance superficially just because they were told that riba or conventional banks are haram? Or really, they are demanding it because they know that they need it in their economic life and appreciate how important is that. Because when God prevents us from something, it must be for a good reason. And the alternative should definitely be good for us. When we talk about Islam in schools, it is about ibadat. The emphasis is mostly about the subject of tawheed, about arkan al-Islam, rukn al-Iman, about prayers, and etc., etc. Essentially about submission to God. If the subject goes further in some schools, then it usually includes the history of Islam, about the lives of the prophets, and how Islam spread during those days, including during the Al-Khulafa al-Rashidun, and perhaps Bani Umayyah and Bani Abbas. What is missing, which is essential for our children and youth to learn, is fiqh al-mu'amalat, of course, with the right dose for each age group. The subject is normally exclusive for those who choose Islamic finance at the tertiary educational levels. Those who choose this would later become practitioners, whether from the Sharia legal side or regulatory authorities or Islamic bankers. But this caters for the supply side. Those who will be managing and operating Islamic finance, not the general consumers themselves. We and our children are not taught about Islamic economies, even the basics of the need to complete a sale transaction involving an aqd, that is, its offer and acceptance. They are not taught about how to make money in Islam, how to make a living based on profits that are promoted in Islam. Actually, even the zakat, which is an economical dimension, and is a very important pillar among the basic fives in Islam, is not emphasized strongly in school, as much as how to pray properly, how to recite Al-Fatiha, and how to fast Ramadan. Often, when we talk about the subject of zakat, not many people understand, understand it thoroughly as they understand their prayers. We as Muslims need to know exactly what it is, what the rules and conditions are, and it must be as precise as possible. We cannot say that I pay this much for zakat, and if I paid more, then I will consider that sadaqah. This is not acceptable in Islam. For example, if we pray dhuhr for rak'ah, we cannot simply pray six, and then say the extra is better, and we can consider four as wajib, and the other two as sadaqah. I'm just giving an example to illustrate how much, when we talk about the need to develop Islamic finance, a lot of us miss the basic knowledge, the need of the customers. With the lack of this knowledge, it often results in the misconception about Islamic finance. This also applies to even professionals and even professors not just the general public. Hence, we hear people who sees the cost of financing a car via an Islamic finance. If it's the same as from a conventional bank, then they say, well, there's no difference between Islamic finance and conventional. They are the same, but with a different name. It's not the same. In Islam, it's not just the material presentation itself, it's also the method whether it is halal or not. For example, if you are to be served a chicken in two plates, one is halal and the other is not, but both are cooked in the same way, would you be able to tell the difference? No. They may look and taste the same, but in Islam, 
One is halal and the other is haram. Because of the preparation method. If you know this as a Muslim, which one do you consume? God say, God saw that in advance and challenged us in the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا الْبَيْعُ مِثْلَ الْرِبَى وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيْعُ وَحَرَّمَ الْرِبَى So they say that selling is like riba, while God made selling halal and forbid a riba. Furthermore, with the law of knowledge, we even see whenever a sharia compliant transaction makes profit, some would argue that it is not halal because it is difficult for them to imagine Islam as being any other than being charitable. They might not be sure here, this is the case among sophisticated people, but I'm talking about the Muslim ummah around the world, especially those that are still at its infancy in terms of Islamic finance. In the opening ceremony, His Excellency the Prime Minister emphasized the need for education for the youth to equip them with the tools to compete in their future world and to contribute to their ummah. And this is what we are trying to specifically mention here. Also, the subject of waqf was discussed, but how much our donors know about that and are educated to know in advance that they should specify in their will so as not while doing well and the intentions are well, they leave a problem of managing awqaf for the future generations. The statement of Zumma al-Maliyah for a woman was mentioned also, the independent financial and identity or personality of women. And how many girls or women studied that or knew about it while they were taught religion at school? Actually, how many men too know about that? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says, Man yuridillah bi khayran yufaqihu fi deen Those whom God means well for them, he educates them in their religion. So, as Muslim countries, we need to emphasize on incorporating fiqh mu'amalat in regular education starting with the children. So we grow up aware of our Islam from its all angles and we live from childhood the economy by Islam. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Jamil. If I can have uh, Professor Abu Nasser Muhammad, please up uh, for a five-minute opening statement. Do you want to come up here, Professor? Mm-hmm. Yes, you. Yes. Please. As it said, the governor, the governors, the main attraction of this morning session, Dr. Jaiji, my very capable moderator and scholars, dear brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Please allow me to seize this opportunity to convey salam to you all. So all the 86 countries participant to the world at large from a piece of land with peace, harmony, communal, and religious. The country known as Bangladesh, newly born, but progressing ahead and to go step by step, hands in hand, with the civilized world. And we thank the government, especially the Honorable Prime Minister, and the people of this country, great country to us, Malaysia, for arranging this August gathering for the youth and the elders, and for their scholars to deliver. We are really thankful 
for all what you have done, for all participants, and we being Bangladeshis, very soft and very touchy, we say to us, here, Honorable Governor, this time I believe Bangladesh is present here, more than 50 participants from different banks, Islamic, and banks having Islamic windows and branches, but conventional, and branch banks having neither windows nor branches, but present here. It shows the eagerness, the determination, the love, the dedication, the submission, the loyalty, and a firm belief of all the 116, 60 million people of my great nation, Bangladesh. We are having seven Islamic banks, 100% Sharia compliant. Out of one is from conventional, convert into Islamic, that's the Exim Bank. And we have branches of at least 10 conventional banks and windows of seven banks. And we are very happy to announce, as you know, that banks like HSBC, Standard Chartered, and Citibank, and they are also having Islamic product. It means they understood it quite full, that the people of this country, they want Islamic products, Islamic banks, and halal risk. Ladies and gentlemen, the issue is very clear, which Honorable Governor has covered from A to Z, like my name. So I have very little to add, but to say, banking for Islam or Islam for banking, there is a gulf of difference. The one goes for exploration of the religion, the other goes to implementation of Islam the complete code of life. And here, without a total, confirmed, honest, transparent, and integrated declaration and avoidance of Sharia, Islamic banking cannot be conceived of. So, we are very happy to inform that banks doing business in Bangladesh has by now earned the international recognition that yes, they are very sincere towards Islamic principle. And you'll be happy to know, Honorable Governor, and my distinguished and esteemed discussion, that there are banks having conven conventional but having some dances. And everyone will tell you there are very seasoned Managing directors, besides the chairmen are here and directors are here. That those who are having branches, the deposit, the investment, and the recognition and appreciation of those branches and windows is number one. It shows, and another point, Honorable Governor, those who are running conventional bank in our country they are not against Islam. It is only because the absence of the real Islamic products or Islamic banking, they had to start or they have started banking. Now, the procession has started and the goal is Kaaba. All are convinced that at the end and ultimate success lies in Islamic banking. And we hope that the third largest Muslim country, that's Bangladesh, will have, inshallah, whole banking system as Islamic. Honorable Governor, as regards the beginning of Islamic banking, yes, it's from 20th century, but the beginning of Islamic transaction is right from the 
I should say, when business or transaction started, it was Islamic. And we have ruled the world, the Muslims, and we had Islamic laws, education system, economic system, and what not. But very unfortunately, as the Westerns or the aggressors, they've aggressed us and eaten up our moral values first and made us to forget our past and made us away from Quran. And here we have re-decided to announce Ya ayyuhu al-lazhi bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Ya ayyuhu al-lazhi nabud khuluz fi silme kaafah wala tattabu khutwaat shaitan innahu lakum adub mubin We are now convinced of it that we have to follow the Islamic laws and the West as Honorable Governor said the failures of the Western economy gave rise among the minds of our youth that what is the alternative? It's not the alternative. This is a just system, as the governor said, and the race is the alternative, that's the conventional. And I have one minute left. I want to say that we want one very, very unified system, and which is given by in Quran and practiced by Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the best student youth. We, no, nobody got, but Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu got, who are ill-educated, uncivilized, that the people of Arab, they are the best students, and they have conquered the world, not for themselves, but to free the people. Now, the people of the world, they're not free. They're exploited. Come, let's say, come, let us change the world. Let us go back to Quran. And let us give the essence of Quran to the world. Let all, all people, all humanity, enjoy peace, harmony, and enjoy their life. And finally, Islamic bank. This is for all community. This is for anyone of any religion. Especially if you take the case of Islamic banks in Bangladesh. Yes, we have Hindus non-Muslims as our depositors, investment clients, and beneficiaries. And no banks in Bangladesh is doing business without social corporate responsibilities. And we are trying to build up our nation alongside, we are trying to tell our youths who are doing very good within the country and across the border beyond, right from America to United Kingdom. You'll find some of them here also, that Bangladesh was a golden Bengal, and we could invite the hungry people from the West to come to our country to loot us. Now we are going to give leadership to the rest of the world with the might that Allah has given us. And we depend on Allah, and he's enough to help us, survive us, give us victory, and the time is coming. Today is theirs, tomorrow is ours. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Professor. Brother Tla, you have a presentation. You have a presentation? Please. If you can put up the presentation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters in Islam, I'm extraordinarily proud to be up here before you, in particular amongst a panel of distinguished and august thought leaders in the Islamic finance world across the country and across the globe. Mr. Rushdie, doctor, governor, and professor, I'm very proud to be part of and to be a student of this very august group. But today, I'm going to be somewhat more specific about what I am presenting because the thought leaders in this 
area have present the global view. I'm here today to talk about a very specific issue, and that is touching on some of the discussion points that my predecessor speakers have uh, talked about, but diving very deep, and that's about Sharia-compliant pension funds. Similar to the professor, I call upon a revolutionary evolution or an evolutionary revolution, whichever you want to pick, in Islamic finance. We are seeing a massive change around the world and Islamic finance has been the next big thing for 20 years. As you can tell by the wide accent that I speak in, in English, it's an Australian accent. And you might be surprised, and I hope to surprise you, and perhaps somewhat delight you in terms of what is happening in, your, in the closest friendly Western nation to uh, Malaysia, my second home. In, in addition to what the governor has so adequately and in detail uh, uh, presented to you today, there are requirements for systems, for transparency, for development of re and harmonization of the regulatory environments in order to, be, to enable cross-border uh, investments. But I also believe, in addition to what the uh, Honourable Governor has presented today and what everybody here I know believes, is that this vision of Islamic finance providing, as the good doctor put it, more than just it's a good thing because they said it, it's halal, you know, so it's not haram, it's halal, therefore it's a good thing. In the sense that there's the one and the other. As Dr. Jamil has so aptly put it, we need to believe, and I know I'm preaching to the converted in this room today, that Islamic finance is a good thing as of itself. Whilst it is religiously an important matter for us, it is economically proving itself around the world. It is delivering results from microfinance to investment houses to merchant houses to pension funds such as ourselves. So I start from that basis and I will not trouble you with the really important detail I think that has already been presented by my co-presenters because I think we are, we are preaching to the converted. Today I want to speak to you about pension funds. Yes, boring pension funds. Slow, over many years, risk-averse, tendacious, someone even might say something a young man like me should not be talking about at such a young age. But I think it is fundamental to the Muslim world itself, not just to Islamic finance, to the Muslim world itself as we go through this evolutionary revolution or revolutionary evolution. And you'll hear a lot about that. Why do I say that? Some sheer statistics. 23%, Muslims constitute 23% of the world's population of 7 billion. Yet, Islamic pension funds constitute less than 1% of the $27 trillion um, for the global pension fund industry. We, at Crescent Wealth, find this strange. Islamic pension funds have clearly been missing a missing piece in the Islamic investment universe. Some countries, including Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, Bahrain, do have pension funds that have diversified their investment portfolios to include Sharia-compliant products. However, this is simply not enough. There is an undeniable need for the massive investment portfolios of pension funds and social security funds to engage in this massive untapped market and gap and to help Muslims who deserve to retire like everyone else in a dignified and respectful manner. We at Crescent Wealth, and my name is obviously Talal Yassin, I'm the Managing Director of Crescent Wealth, have tried to pioneer the development of a 100% Sharia-compliant Islamic pension fund because we have recognized this enormous untapped potential in the global market. 
Our business model has been dedicated to the development of a consolidated specialized pension fund that is 100% Sharia compliant and covers all relevant asset classes. In Australia, believe it or not, Western country, 500,000 Muslims only. We are talking here to representatives of at least 1 to 2 billion Muslims. So I invite you to extrapolate the figures. We're talking about a Islamic 100% Islamic pension fund in Australia, which has uh, what we call superannuation. Uh, in English, that means enforced savings or compulsory savings for every employee in the country, no matter what background you are. So we have a superannuation system in Australia that was founded some years ago by our famous Prime Minister Paul Keating, who famously did not get on with the Prime Minister of Malaysia at the time, but we'll forget that. But two distinguished leaders in their own right and two reformists and, and, and I would call civilization makers. So in the Australian market, Crescent Wealth has set up, because you'd be asking in your mind, well, why would 100% Islamic Sharia, Islamically compliant Sharia pension fund set up in Australia of all places? Because we believe there's a $22 billion market. 9% of all income that is derived from an employee must go into a pension fund managed by private entities. Uh, we have set up on the basis that there is a market by 2020 of $22 billion, and that is being conservative and is likely to grow. In order, this is so in order to provide Australian Muslims and Australians at large an ultra-ethical investment product that allows them to retire and to pick their investment of their pension money is in something they believe in that is halal or ultra-ethical, but at the same time meets or beats market. And so on that basis, we have partners by, with some of the world's best performing and most renowned companies in Islamic finance today, most of which are represented here, including HSBC Amana, the Bank of London and the Middle East, Satuna Capital, Thomson Reuters, to name a few. Like Crescent Wealth, these companies have been quick to gain exposure in this strong and growing market for, inshallah, a huge pension fund market. I believe, again, that pension funds, uh, the pension funds which now globally, not the Islamic ones, dominate the financial markets, will continue to shape the economic, sec economic security, community progress, and the, indeed the wealth of many nations. While the key objective to a pension fund is to provide adequate post-retirement income, the workings of pension schemes have been having very important implications for economic development, particularly through their effects on savings, financial intermediaries, and, in fact, government finance. Indeed, there is a direct link between growing pension assets and economic development of a nation. At the individual level, pension funds provide one with the confidence that they can maintain a certain standard of living as they enter retirement, ensuring, one hopes, security and peace of mind. Eventually, the pension fund holders will want their money to be invested in Muslim countries in a Sharia-compliant manner. Unfortunately, today, not many are thinking about that. And my clarion call today is to think in a deep way about how we can, um, all of us together, create a pension scheme that is Sharia compliant and hopefully, inshallah, uh, uh, planting these seeds around the world to ensure Muslims have uh, the ability to retire in the peace and prosperity and the dignity that they uh, deserve. On a final note, Australia has a, has a uh, $1.4 trillion superannuation industry, the fourth largest pension scheme in the world. That's 4.8% of uh, global pension assets, an equivalent of 103% of, of our Australian gross domestic product. Our pension fund products are 100% Sharia compliant, which is saying something in one of the most, if not the most highly regulated environments in the world. Australia fights way above its belt in this regard. The US, it's led, the, the largest fund management uh, industries in the world are led by the USA, at 11.1 trillion, followed by Luxembourg at 2.2 trillion, then France at 1.8 trillion, then Australia at 1.4 trillion. 
bearing in mind, Australia only has 23.5 million people. However, looking at our highly regulated market in terms of pension funds and investment at the sophistication and the scope of the Australian market and at the difficulty of ensuring 100% Sharia compliance, we at Crescent Wealth have launched this, this world first dedicated, pure, specialised, Sharia compliant pension fund um, after many years of battling, educating and in fact persuading regulators and investors alike, think of what could happen around the rest of the Western and Islamic world. I invite you and my main message, if there's anything that I'm taking away today, to think about that issue about creating post-retirement <coughs> peace of mind for the many millions of Muslims around the world who retire each year and the good business proposition that it indeed could be in the longer term. Thank you very much and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Thank you, Brother Talal. We've got about 17 minutes. Let me start off by asking the question uh, to our panelists, one question for the panelists, and we'll open it up to yourself. Governor, um, you've been a pillar of strength in talking about financial stability. One of the things about Islamic finance is its transparency. Therefore, transparency implies pricing risk. And that seems to be one of the comparative advantages of Islamic finance, that transparency resulting in pricing risk. Governor, from the uh, people that you meet and the presentations that you make on the global stage, how do we spread that message that Islamic finance, let's put the religious aspect aside and talk about what regulators and institutional investors and financiers want to hear, which is we better price risk, and that results in better financial stability, Governor. Um, the, the pricing of risk is very, very critical because we have seen so much of mispricing of risk in the conventional finance, which in fact is one of the major factors that contribute to the crisis. And Islamic finance, because it's profit sharing and therefore risk sharing, uh, that it becomes an uh, inherent part of it that uh, risk is managed and priced and the, in the contracts where you have the disclosure uh, and therefore transparency. It would be a very important role of all the international um, multilateral entities uh, such as IOFI, uh, in reporting, uh, and uh, IFSB in setting the prudential standards, and to highlight this important feature. But not only is it um, part of uh, an inherent part of Islamic finance, but the new uh, um, prudential regulations that are being introduced the risks and governance structures that are reinforcing this and the harmonization process. Uh, this needs to be highlighted. So all those who participate in the process needs to highlight this aspect of uh, Islamic finance. And it's very useful that you have highlighted it as a specific area because it's very uh, current now given uh, the mispricing that has taken place. Thank you, Thank Governor. You. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jamil and uh, Professor, you talked about demand-based. Two aspects come to mind. One is education. The second is efficiency. 
And the third is COBM, which is cost of being a Muslim. Islamic finance in certain markets is inefficient. Therefore, there's a cost of being a Muslim. If you could comment on uh, your takeaway message, which was on the demand side, and then the education necessary to have the right questions asked on the demand side, and the efficiency, you are the CEO of a new bank in Oman. The efficiency, are you going to be as efficient as the conventional banks? Because at the end of the day, that's what the population wants. They want better financing or they want better returns or comparable returns. So if you would comment on that. As far as the, go back to the demand side, I think this is exactly what I was trying to highlight today. We use the words innovation, we use the words of transparency, we use the word of efficiency. If we really look deep into the practice of the early Islam, all of these were there. Even marketing tools were mentioned by Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So really, if we look back into our economy and try to build it as it should be, we find everything is there. So I'm not worried about efficiency. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Man atqana amalahu faqad ahsan. Those people who perform well as if they really performed ihsan, which is the highest level in our religion. You have Islam, you have then uh, Iman, and then you have ihsan. So really it is there. Transparency is there. When he went once into the souk, and he saw that one person was selling uh, burr, which is like, like uh, wheat, and he had hidden the wet one underneath. And Rasul put his hand, and he lifted the wheat, and he said, why don't you de expose it to people? So really, to summarize on this front, I think if we look deeply into our religion and try to practice it and learn it, and we are proud of it, I think we shouldn't worry about the modern economy or modern technology. As far as efficiency, when you mentioned now Oman, and if I want to be as efficient as the uh, conventional banks, probably I'd like to be better than that. Mm -hmm. That's our aspiration, and that's our goal. Yeah, we always try to say, with all due respect to everybody, that people think of an Islamic banker before that it's a beard and a short tube and a masbaha. No. Actually, there's nothing wrong with that, but what I'm trying to say here that Islamic bankers could be three-piece suitors also. They are graduate of Wall Street or uh, Bond Street or whatever. So yes, inshallah, we are shooting to be that. Our aim is to be a global bank. Of course, we'd like to walk before we run, but we are determined to do that. Thank you. Professor. Are the banks in Bangladesh conventionally efficient? Are the Islamic banks in Bangladesh conventionally efficient on pricing, financing products for mortgages or car vehicles? And are they market efficient on investment products? Well, thank you very much. Uh, in Bangladesh, very fortunately, the Islamic banks are rated as best banks by the regulators, by the customers, by the beneficiaries, by the people, by the press, because of its, uh, they are using the latest technology, the, as modern as it is possible by now. And we are following the business ethics, at the same time, we are addressing the five basic needs of the human being, that is, from food to education, and we are registered, I should say, well acknowledged sectors from among the banks that we are fulfilling our commitment to the people in general, irrespective of the caste, creed, sex, and gender. And if I understood your question correctly, I would say that our government and the regulators and the people, youths, the teachers, ulama, 
that all were satisfied with the services of Islamic banks and Islamic bank. Especially if you take the bank which uh, I'm working as uh, chairman, that is the largest bank in that country. Largest in respect to deposit, investment, export, import, remittance, <coughs> and employment in all respects. And if we take the all banks that we are having, Islamic banks, we are covering more than 30% of the Bangladeshi business altogether. So, uh, that is what I, if I understood your question, you can say, uh, tomorrow is better than today for us, even in Bangladesh. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Brother Talal, you have a mighty task ahead of you. And alhamdulillah, you have done some groundbreaking work. The question to you is the following. If we look at a traditional pension fund, it has a balanced portfolio representation of equities, fixed income, alternative asset classes, cash, so on and so forth. With the Sharia screens and the prohibitions against interest, obviously that universe is reduced. And because uh, the screening, there's a uh, fewer number of companies that are publicly listed. My point again is the cost of being a Muslim. An Islamic pension fund, is that a cost of being a Muslim because you've removed the variety of options available that a conventional pensioner has? Thank you. The cost of being a Muslim, let's be very financial and create a ratio. So when you have a one, it means it's 100%. Anything less than one, it's you know, zero. And then you go negative because it's the benefit of being a Muslim, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I think that's a very important question without uh, joking about it. The universe for investment in terms of Australian equities or international equities will necessarily be limited by the fact that we don't invest in financials or banks. However, this question is asked to me on many, many occasions. In fact, every Western journalist asks the first thing. So investing in less, in less shares, you've got less systemic uh, diversification. But what I say to them is, what are we investing less in? The majority of it is less in debt. So we invest in deleverage. So when the global financial crisis came along, it didn't come along because of Islamic banking techniques. It came along because the Western world invested in securitized debt, which they lost control of. So I say, I always turn it on its head and say, well, you know, we don't invest in financials, that's, that's a big one, but we don't invest in tobacco, armaments, pornography, et cetera, the usual suspects. But a lot of your funds don't do that either. The big difference is financials. And I say it's an advantage to have a more limited universe, not a disadvantage. And at the very, very least, when I go to the Australian market, the broader Australian market, I say invest some of your money in deleverage. And so... When you ask the question, do we have worse off returns? Is there a cost of being Muslim? I would say, given the performance of someone like Satuna and the investment funds as they mature around the world, the answer is definitely no. We're a low-value, long-term investor. We don't day trade or year trade. We trade in decades. Wonderful. Thank you. We've got about, about five minutes. Um, please uh, raise... Okay. Let's ask... Three questions. Uh, please stand up. This way the microphone will come. Very short question. I'll cut you off in the interest of time. So that's one question. Stand up there. Two questions. And that lady there. Sorry. So just keep standing up and the microphone will come. Please keep your questions short. After the first question, let's go to the second question and the third question. Thank you very much. Actually, I would like to initially recognize two, three things, you know. What I have received from the speakers, especially Madam Jelly Akhtar, the Honorable Governor of the Malaysian Bank, says that we need the technical competence and the uh, uh, intellectual resources. On the other hand, uh, Mr. Abu Nasser says we need the unified system. And also Mr. Jamil says the mainstream finance, Islamic finance, should be the mainstream finance. My question is that, how do we have any plan how we can promote this Islamic finance 
as a plain label field for everyone, such as, I'm a Muslim, I have shop, everyone is coming to me and they are buying. There is no branding. Branding is, this brand is good, effective, good product, reasonable price. It's beneficiary. For Muslim, it's halal, okay. Now, all the Islamic bank is targeting mostly the halal product for the Muslim. Why don't you go for this product, since it is effective, even in this recession, as a proven track record, that you are doing the business, business for profitability. So why don't you take this option as a, one of the options which is the best option for you? Do you have any plan to go about with this, to brand this product worldwide as a plain label field for everybody? Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. One second, sir. I have one thing to... No, we don't uh, have time, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Next, uh, the next question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is Faz Chowdhury. I'm with the Muslim Council of Britain. Uh, I work in the banking industry as a risk analyst. Uh, my question actually is uh, very simple. Islamic finance, from what I understand, and please correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, is asset-based. Mm -hmm. So if it is asset-based and the vast majority of Muslims are very, very poor and have no assets, how do you cater for them and how do you raise their standard so that they can become a middle-class Muslims and improve the quality of uh, the Ummah? Thank you very much. The third question. Thank you. I am Dr. Asfur, president of the Egyptian Business Women Association. I thank very much the governor and all the speakers. My question will be really how to popularize it among all sectors of society. We are here very elite, 2,000 people representing the whole Ummah, but implementing the Islamic financing on the grassroots and all sectors of the society for a small and medium enterprise, macro enterprise. We heard her, uh, the Honorable Governor saying that it needed capacity building to really implement such of, um, Islamic financing. Who will be doing that? Is it the conventional banks or we were going to create Islamic banks? How can it be really provided across the whole Ummah? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, Governor, would you, which question would you like to take and please? Uh, the, the question on, uh, I will just say something on uh, two of the questions. Uh, the uh, level playing field for everyone. I would like to just mention that in my whole experience in being involved with Islamic finance, that there is tremendous participation, first in Malaysia. If you ask our banks, more than 50% of the participation in uh, the financial institutions are from non-Muslims. The Islamic financial in banking, for example, is now accounts for 22%. Uh, 12 years ago, it was only 6% of our total banking system, and now it is 22. So within 12 years, its significance increased. And why did it increase? It is because that it, the innovation process has generated products and services, financial products and services that meet the requirements of consumers, of businesses, and therefore, this is why it increased. Then when we look at the sukuk market, who were the first ones who raised sukuk in Malaysia itself? It was not a Muslim corporation. It was actually an international uh, uh, energy-based uh, corporation. And we have seen Japanese, Koreans, uh, non-Muslim countries raise such financing from our market. And so this is the most encouraging thing. It is one area where the Muslim world can actually bring forward to the international community something that is really positive because of its linkage to economic activity, because it is competitive, because it is also uh, is regulated. So these are the things that have really uh, reinforced uh, the sustainability of Islamic finance for the in, uh, entire community, Muslim and non-Muslim. Uh, and the other question of how it is uh, to be uh, popularized, well, it is the combined efforts of the regulators, of the public sector, 
of the industry uh, and of the educators. It is everybody. Everybody has to do their part. If it's just uh, the regulator pushing it, like the central bank, it is not going to happen. It, the industry has to rise up to the challenge to bring it forward. Thank, Thank you, you, Governor. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Jamil, please take questions, but short response in the interest of time. Sure, I'll try to respond to all three quickly. Quickly. First of all, as for the business, uh, to, to, for everybody, a previous experience of mine, I'm talking here as an, uh, a, an operator and executive, not as a regulator, of course. 70% of my clients in Lebanon, which is a country I think it's known to so many people, were Christian, as a matter of fact, because they recognized the efficiency and the proficiency and the return we're giving them. So we were for everybody, and that's in Lebanon. Uh, as far as for the uh, risk element and asset base, here this is something really I would like to call for us to think about that first of all, the quality of the asset has to be uh, well chosen, and that's why you need well research and due diligence in when Islamic banks go to the market with the asset. But here I would like also to talk to the regulators, particularly the Basel Committee, that they should start recognizing Islamic bank as a specialized industry and try to advise a special ratios and rates for us to rely on that fact that our asset base is different than the conventional banks. Uh, as far as for the priority of businesses, definitely SMEs should be on the agenda of everybody, of Islamic banks, because it is an equity, uh, uh, could be a more of an equity base, because small, uh, medium enterprises would need capitalization more than anything else. You have the operator, you have the specialty, but you need to make them stand on their feet. And there's a fantastic tool in Islamic finance, which is DEP, Diminishing Equity Participation. I think this will be a fantastic method to help SMEs to stand on their feet, and I hope everybody try to support it from the uh, Islamic bank, uh, finance. Thank you. That was fast. Uh, professor, even yeah. faster, please. Uh, thank you very much. I am professor in name only. <laughs> uh, incidentally, maximum Muslim countries themselves are SME in nature still a semi in nature. Uh, in our country, all the banks, especially the Islamic banks, we follow the portfolio. And SME is there, and we are giving high priority towards it. Then microfinance, you know that, uh, <coughs> who doesn't know the name of Dr. Yunus? He has really awakened the whole world, but uh, his one is riba based and we Islam Bank are having rural development scheme, which is a reference of Islamic Development Bank. And the other day, Dr. Ahmad Muhammad Ali, he was saying, wherever he goes, either to Mr. Blair or to uh, any African countries, he refers about the rural development uh, RDS scheme of Islamic Bank, and also we have priority for the women entrepreneurs. Plus we have WAKF, and also we have Kardun Hassan. And by doing all these, and side by side, research is going on, so we are addressing not, not A or B only, we are trying to cover all classes of people. I want to add one point, Honorable Coordinator, uh, Moderator, that uh, as Honorable Governor said, if a cow is slaughtered in the name of Allah, even a Christian or a non, any non-Muslim can eat it, no problem. For us, there is problem, we cannot eat it, it is prohibited. So Islamic bank as the hawa or the air or the sun or the moon. This is for all human beings. So Islamic system, Islamic banking, Islamic enterprises, and Islamic approach, this is all good and good for humanity. Then which is what we are practicing, and the rest of the world is coming ahead. They are realizing. We are in the concept, then re Practice started in the 70s, and now recognition is there by 
East and West both. And only thing which I said unified, and the difficulty still with the Muslim countries, there are still conventional and Islamic banks in many Muslim countries. I would not say these are their countries. There I meant the Muslim country should first feel that they have been given the best of the best, that is the Quran, and the best man of the world, that is Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The only Uswai Hasana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brother. I'm uh, fine in the interest of time. <laughs> you sure you don't want to say anything? You, you're asking me a lawyer to talk? <laughs> you definitely... <laughs> so, the conference organizers will re-invite you next year in London, so thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, we've run out of time, I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the governor, Dr. Jamil, Professor, Brother Talal. Thank you all very much. If you can give them a round of applause. <laughs> Madam MC. Thank you once again to our distinguished keynote speaker and our esteemed panelists. I'd like to invite all of you to the front as we have a short photo session before we finish with this session.